Welcome to the Worship Leader Coaching Podcast, helping you go from leading songs to leading people. I'm your host, Caleb Holgerson. On this show, I talk with local church worship leaders about worship, leadership, creativity, and teamwork. We believe that by working together and learning from each other, we can build worshiping churches that are passionate about the presence of God. Let's get started. Well, hey, worship leaders, it's good to be back with you today. Today's show is going to be a little bit different. We don't have an interview today. Today is just me, and I wanted to talk about discipleship. And as I was, as I was gathering my thoughts about discipleship, I thought, you know what? I wrote an entire chapter about discipleship as a worship leader in my book, Becoming a Worship Pastor. And so I'm reading that today. I'm going to read from my from this chapter titled Timothy and Barnabas. It's chapter two of my book, and I think uh, it's going to help you wrap your mind around discipleship a little bit more. But before we get there, I want to tell you about my new uh, endeavor, my new venture, Morris Guitar Company, a shop that I started here um, just a few weeks ago, where we sell high quality used guitars to musicians like you. Why used, you might be wondering. It's simple, really. When you buy used, you can get a higher quality guitar at a better price. As a musician, price matters to me. I've tried my hand at playing professionally. I've played professionally in in churches for years. I know what gigs pay. I know what churches pay. Having been a hobbyist before that, I know it's not always plausible to put a ton of money into a new instrument. Price is a big deal. It's a big deal. And it's often been the reason I've settled for a lesser product than I really wanted. And I don't want that to happen to you. Now let's talk about quality. There's a common belief that new equals better. I disagree. You don't have to sacrifice quality when buying a used guitar. Used doesn't mean used up. Used just means it's been taken out of the box before you got it. A well-crafted, cared-for, and properly stored guitar will last a lifetime, whether it's changed hands before you or not. My promise to you is that I'll never sell you a guitar I wouldn't play myself, recommend to someone on my worship team, or give to my nephew. I don't want you to settle for any less than you really want. I want to sell you the guitar of your dreams at a price you can afford. Please check out morrisguitarcompany.com. And because you're a listener to this podcast, you get 10% off any order. So if any order at morrisguitarcompany.com, use code WLC10 at checkout and you get 10% off. Uh, whether that's, you know, you're getting guitar strings and some picks or a guitar itself, check it out today. Morris Guitar Company, M O R R I S Guitar Company dot com. Now let's jump into today's subject. Nathan is one of the greatest mentors I've ever had. Who's the worship leader at a church I attended, as well as the communications director for another ministry. Recently, he stepped out of his role as the communications director director and into a new role in the organization. When I asked him how the new role was going, he said it was great, that in anything he was doing, his job stayed the same. Nathan's exact words were, I'm here to make disciples. What I love about Nathan is that that statement really does sum up everything he does. He's constantly bringing people along, pouring into them, and sending them off. Nathan is the greatest example of a disciple maker I know. That's what makes him a great leader and a great pastor. It's not his skill or even his knowledge of the Bible. Although skill and knowledge are necessary, those traits aren't what makes Nathan stand out. It's his desire to grow people. He's in the people development business. Being a disciple of Jesus means being a student of Jesus, one who studies him. Each of Jesus' 12 disciples spent three years studying him. They watched him, ate with him, listened to him, and as a result became like him. In fact, that was their entire goal of spending time with him. When a, when a Jewish man wanted to follow a rabbi, he was expected to live with the rabbi 24 hours a day, learning from his every move. A disciple's calling was to walk in the dust of the rabbi, meaning that he was to walk so closely behind the rabbi that he would be covered in the dirt his rabbi kicked up. 
The hope was that by following so closely and watching his rabbi's every move, the disciple would become like him. That's exactly what Christ's disciples did. They walked in his dust. As pastors, we should be doing the same, bringing people along with us and showing them the way. That's called discipleship. Discipleship is defined as teaching one person the doctrines of another. In the case of the Christian, it's one person teaching another the ways of Jesus. Discipleship isn't just key to ministry, it is ministry. It's growing people, and when done properly, it's growing people who grow people. It's creating leaders who create leaders. And Jesus brought his disciples along, and then he sent them out. Then Jesus left, he was crucified, resurrected, and ascended. You know the story. But that didn't stop the ministry. In fact, it was just the beginning. It was Jesus grew leaders who grew leaders. Jesus was a disciple maker who made disciples. Just as it does with vision, the first chapter is on vision. Just as it does with vision, discipleship starts with the team. In fact, the team should be the main focus of discipleship for the worship pastor. Looking to Jesus as the, as the example, we see that he had lots of followers, but he put his focus on a few. There may be a lot of people in a church, but a disciple maker will focus on discipling a few. For the worship pastor, it's your team. Worship pastors spend more time with the worship team than they, than they do with any other group of people in the church. So the worship pastor's focus should be on taking every opportunity possible to pour into the team. We should be leaders who create leaders. Rehearsals. Everyone who walks through the front doors on a Sunday morning sees the worship team. For that reason, I want my team to lead well. In order to do that, they need to be led well. They need to be discipled. They need to know their role in the church. The number one way that I disciple my team is through our weekly rehearsal time. Rehearsals are an integral part of leading an effective worship ministry. For me, they've become a key factor not only in how I lead worship, but in how I pastor people, cast vision, and build effective teams. I began to value rehearsals when I realized that rehearsals were opportunities for both practical and spiritual development. Rehearsals are weekly opportunities for discipleship. If I'm honest, I used to hate rehearsals. Don't get me wrong, I wanted the team to sound good. We all want that. But I didn't think showing up on a Thursday night after a long day of work and playing through the same old songs over and over again was worth it. I thought, let's just get it close and we'll figure out the rest on Sunday morning. But then, after a short spree of not-so-worshipful worship services, I learned to value them. Practically, rehearsals are an opportunity to get the music right before Sunday morning. That's huge. Practice, however, is what you do on your own. My, te- my team lives by the mantra, practice is what happens before rehearsal. Practice is where you prepare your part and where you prepare your heart. Rehearsal is where we put all the parts together. It's where we ensure that keys and guitar parts don't clash, that background vocalists are singing the best possible harmonies, and the dynamics are right and breaks and transitions are tight. What we, what we have realized is that if if everyone is learning their parts at rehearsal, we have to push all the other stuff back to Sunday morning. If we don't have enough time to nail down everything on Sunday morning, our services suffer. If our services suffer, we're not leading well. We cease to be an effective team. When we come into rehearsals prepared, however, I can take my focus off of music and put it on discipleship. When we come into rehearsals prepared, we lead well on Sunday morning. When I don't have to focus on the music, I can place my focus on the team. Rehearsals are a weekly opportunity for me to connect with my team outside of the hustle of Sunday morning. They allow me to be part of the lives of those on my team. They're a prime opportunity for us to fellowship, pray, and of course, worship. Being that our rehearsals are towards the end of the week, I often hear of the struggles and celebrations of the week. I know where people are coming from when they're preparing to lead. Knowing these things makes me a better pastor. It shows me how I can lead my team better. At the end of every rehearsal, I gather my worship team together for 10 to 15 minutes to share with them a specific vision for the weekend and what to be praying for. It's a moment every week to align our hearts and refocus our purpose. We believe that what we want to see happen in our church, our community, and the world begins with us. 
when I do this, I'm sharing with my team the role in our ministry. I'm taking a moment to focus on, you guessed it, discipleship. To grow my team's leadership capacity in rehearsals, I routinely ask team members to lead devotionals and to pray over the church and team. I, I, I've given new vocalists opportunities to try leading songs. I've started musicians and music directing roles. I've found that there is an abundance of discipleship opportunity associated with rehearsals. When I steward those opportunities well, leaders grow quickly. Find a Timothy. As leaders begin to grow, I'm always searching for one or two people to pour into a little more, to develop a little further. I'm looking for people who have a greater desire for growth and a heart for worship. Often this is someone who is maybe just a step or two behind me in skill or training, but often someone who is way beyond me in potential. This is kind of a Paul and Timothy idea. I'm searching for those who I can spend time developing further. When I first started in pastoral ministry, a very wise pastor told me this. At some point in your ministry, you will find there is someone under your leadership who has more anointing than you do. Learn to lead them well. To be honest, at first, that thought scared me. Partly because I probably wanted to be the most anointed pastor on the planet, but more so because I knew I wasn't. And I wasn't sure I had the capacity or the character to lead someone with a greater anointing. After the initial fright wore off, though, I began to see this as a challenge. I began looking for people with more anointing than I have, people with more skill, talent, and potential. Currently, I have a worship leader serving under me who is more skilled, more talented, and I believe more anointed than I am. He has all the pieces he needs in order to lead worship well, pastor well, and to see people come to Jesus. He just needs help putting those pieces together. That's my job in discipling him, to give him practical tools to lead the church. Stephen is an incredible guitar player, a gifted music director, and a passionate worship leader. He genuinely loves Jesus, the church, and seeing people find life in Christ. The only things he needs help with are casting vision to the team and speaking that vision over the church. The way I develop him is by walking him through how I do it. We frequently have conversations about a vision for a weekend and how to share that vision with the team. I show him how vision flows through everything from building a set list to rehearsals to Sunday morning. Then I give him opportunities to build the set that way and cast vision to the team. As far as speaking over the church goes, I often give Stephen opportunities to pray or speak between songs. Stephen is constantly growing because I'm constantly giving him opportunities to grow. I give him the tools he needs to lead well. Soon, Stephen will be transitioning into a campus worship leader role for a new campus our church is planting. Over the last few months, as we've been preparing for this transition, Stephen and I have discussed many aspects of worship, worship leading, including becoming a disciple maker. Basically, everything that I've been showing him, he needs to show someone else. We've, been, we've even brainstormed who that person could be as we've built this new team. As a leader who will soon be creating, he's a leader who will soon be creating leaders, a growing person who will soon be growing people. This is important because growing leaders grow the team both spiritually and practically. Growing the team grows the church. Growing the church is our ultimate goal. Discipleship is how Jesus started the church. It's why his disciples wrote the Gospels. It's how Christianity has always spread. The Apostle Paul is easily one of the greatest disciple makers of all time. He traveled the world evangelizing, planting churches, and growing and instructing believers. The churches that he was instructing could be considered teams. The teaching was both important for growth and broad enough to touch everyone in the church. Paul could not take the time to pour into everyone on the team one-on-one. -on -one. However, he did narrow his discipleship down to one person to spend time developing, Timothy. Timothy was Paul's right hand. He traveled with him, planted churches with him, and taught with him. Timothy was a student of Paul's work. He was learning to build the church. As a result of his eagerness to learn, Paul sent Timothy to, uh, to Corinth and Philippi on his behalf to teach and correct believers. Doing so built Timothy's influence in the church. It connected him to other ministry leaders, and it gave him new opportunities to serve and work in his giftings. 
Those are the goals of discipleship. Discipleship is teaching one person the doctrines of Jesus so that they can influence the church, grow leaders, and find and serve in their giftings. Find a Barnabas. When I was working with Nathan, he was constantly connecting me to people and to opportunities in order to clarify and develop my gifts. At the time that Nathan came into my life, I'd all but failed out of college. I was working a dead-end job, and I was far from the goal I had of becoming a pastor. I was frustrated with where I was at, but I didn't know how to move forward. Over the course of several meetings, I'd expressed these things to Nathan, and one day at lunch, everything changed. He suggested a way to finish school that I hadn't thought of. And then he even started making phone calls to get me started before I had the opportunity to change my mind. After that, he, con- he connected me to an opportunity with a ministry. Within nine months of that conversation, I was finishing school and stepping into my first role in full-time ministry. Nathan was a Barnabas to me. Barnabas was the Apostle Paul's mentor. After his conversion, Barnabas took Paul under his wing. Initially, initially, the disciples were afraid of Paul because of his past as Saul. Many feared he was not actually a believer and was attempting to fool them. But Barnabas walked with Paul. He protected him from the Jews, taught with him, and encouraged him. In fact, the name Barnabas means son of encouragement. I don't think that's a coincidence. I believe it's a biblical directive to disciple makers to be encouraging. That said, disciple makers also need encouragement. All ministers of the gospel should have both a Barnabas and a Timothy, someone to guide them and help them as well as someone they are guiding and helping, someone who's a few steps ahead of them and someone who's a few steps behind them. This ensures that pastors have pastors, that disciples are continually growing and are always being poured into. Proverbs 12.15 says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Always have a counselor. Always be seeking leaders to learn from. Always be seeking leaders to teach. Discipleship is the most effective tool there is for kingdom growth. Discipleship is how early leaders operated, how the early church operated, and how we should operate now. Discipleship brings students along, builds them up, and sends them out. Discipleship spreads the gospel of Jesus. That's chapter 2 of my book, Becoming a Worship Pastor. Discipleship's been on my mind a lot lately, guys. I think we can all do a better job of pouring into our teams, taking our focus off of the the day-to-day things, you know, the tasks. The tasks are important. But people are more important. We are in the people development business. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Worship Leader Coaching Podcast. For books, one-on-one coaching, and other resources, visit our website, worshipleader.me, or connect with us on Instagram at worshipleadercoaching. Coaching.